Hi, I'm back in Indianapolis. Boy, I've had a few months of some incredible travel. And along the way, I've been shooting with a lot of different cameras and uh, we're doing a lot of interesting projects right now. And uh, today, I got something in the mail. And uh, you know I'm a big Sony guy. Uh, Sony's put out four cameras this year. They've all been quite exciting, having a lot of fun with all of them. But the newest camera to come out is this. It's the Sony A7R Mark III. Now, luckily for me, I've had the chance to be shooting with this camera quite a bit through events that Sony's had. And really, I've just been so impressed with what this camera's done. It's, it, it takes all the things that were wrong with the A7R II and fixes them. Bigger battery, you can shoot hundreds and hundreds of exposures now, up to even over a thousand. Um, you've got two card slots, you've got a, a little bit better dynamic range, a little bit better image stabilizer, uh, faster focus. The IAF on this camera is absolutely amazing. So th this is just the most exciting camera to come out. Now, you know, there's a lot of companies releasing cameras. Nikon done a great job this year putting the Nikon D850 out. Marvelous camera, no argument there. Um, Canon, where are you? I don't see you coming out with much cool stuff this year. Uh, so hopefully 2018 will be uh, a little bit more fun. But uh, Sony is a force to be reckoned with. They put the A9 out this year with some incredible performance specs. I also own the Sony A9. They've taken it to a number of uh, countries. I, I took it to Greenland and Salvard, and uh, it just was an amazing performer. Coupled with the 100 to 400 G Master lens, uh, 20 frames a second, super autofocus, no screen blackout. Uh, I came back with some absolutely incredible shots, and we'll be coming back to that camera and uh, some news on that in the very near future. But today, let me take this out of the box. I'm not a big unboxer, but uh, let me show you what we got here. Then I'm going to set it up and we're gonna come back and we're gonna go over the Sony menus. So here we go. It's always fun when you get a camera in the mail and they ship it. It's beautiful. Just open it up, you take the manuals, you've got power cords. And uh, they normally put these things in like a little sack. So here it is. So how nice is this? By the way, I hear that if you order from B&H and the links are below, for a while there B&H was sending two cameras for every camera ordered, uh, simply by mistake, I think. But I bet you somebody in the warehouse is uh, not going to be um, working there much longer. So here we have it. Oh, this is such a great looking camera. It feels good in the hands. A lot of people don't think that it's ergonomically designed like some of the other cameras. But uh, I end up putting a battery grip on the bottom, which gives me uh, two additional batteries, or one additional battery since it's running off of the two batteries in the grip. And it really does uh, feel a lot better for me. I like that bulkiness, and then you know my hand is uh, taken care of. You'll see that uh, when I get it all set up. So let me come back in a few minutes. I'm gonna get my drive on here, put the lens on here, and then we're gonna set the menus up, and I'm gonna show you how I set menus up for the Sony A7R Mark III. This is my Sony A7R III setup. Right now I have the 16 to 35 millimeter lens on here. These green labels, they're my identify labels. I put these on uh, most of my gear so that uh, if something ever happened, I could find it. It comes in very handy on iPads and iPhones, especially if you're prone to leaving them on airplanes like I've done once or twice. Um, I have the 16 to 35 millimeter lens A7R Mark III with the optional battery grip on the bottom. I use Peak Design straps, and these are the lugs that I use for the straps themselves. I happen to have one of the straps here. And the beauty of these is you can take them on and off very quickly versus the uh, camera manufacturer strap. And so like if you have it on a tripod and it's got a windy day, this thing's not flapping in the wind causing the camera to move, or you can change it over to a wrist strap or anything else, it's quite nice. The other thing I have is the Really Right Stuff L bracket, and this L bracket is designed to work with the battery grip and uh, essentially just kind of puts it on right by itself. It's pretty nice because they've really gotten good to the point where they actually include the Allen wrench right into the uh, grip now. 
so that it's easy to take on or off and find an Allen wrench, which used to be a real problem if anybody's had those experiences in the past. So when I go out in the field, I'll have this grip and it's set so I can do vertical or horizontal very easily. And with this battery grip, I also have controls, which are the same camera controls I have uh, so that when I'm in vertical mode, I can operate the camera and I can lock these off too so I don't hit them by accident uh, when I'm actually working with this camera. So uh, great camera, but the thing about this camera that gets a lot of people and probably the thing that Sony's had the most negative comments on for many years now, and even though they've improved considerably, is the menu system. And so this is what I'm going to try to help you out with today. Getting your menu set up, and at least the way I have my menu set up, and how I set my function buttons and uh, quick buttons and so forth for uh, shooting out in the field. So if you're ready, let's get into this. What we're going to be doing is setting up the menus the way I set them up. I'm not going to go into complete detail on a lot of certain features because this camera has got more features than you can wag a stick at. I'm going to talk about how I use these features. I'll tell you a little bit of detail about some. If you really need help with any of these, Sony has a 660 page roughly uh, help guide, which you can download, just do Sony A7R Mark III or A7R III help guide in Google and you'll come up with a couple sources on how you can download this massive document. I actually downloaded it and put it into my iPad and so that uh, if I'm out in the field, I can refer to it any particular time. I've actually also put it into my notepad, which is right here. And this also means I can go in here and make my notes in here. So what I can do is I'll use the manual, but if I actually start doing settings, I can write in here what kind of settings I'm doing and uh, have those as another reference. So it's kind of like an annotation kind of thing. And I use NoteShelf for that. I'll have this here for reference in case I need it, but uh, let's get going. So the first thing we got, and I have my camera set up so that we're recording, so you see the wire coming out of here, it's just an HDMI output into my computer. Uh, before I get started, I should probably shoot a picture of Michael. There's Michael. So hang on, we'll take a shot of him, but there he is working. Okay, so that's the man behind the camera working here. Uh, with us and uh, we'll talk more about Michael in some upcoming videos. So here we go. We're going to go and push the menu button which is on the top left uh, of the back of the camera and I'm not going to go into some of the menu button settings quite yet and the first thing we have is file format. So if we push the file format button we have three choices raw, raw and JPEG and JPEG. Now you can decide how you want to shoot. I shoot only raw however sometimes if you or out and you want to have JPEGs for fast use or something, you can shoot RAW and JPEG, or just JPEG itself. Oh, God forbid why you would want to do that. Okay, so uh, I have RAW set up uh, for mine. Now, Capture One from Phase One comes with the Sony cameras, and I highly recommend uh, that you take a look at Capture One. I've been Capture One user for probably 15 years, and it's what I find to be the best workflow out there, and it's really optimized for Sony files. So give it a shot, it comes with the camera system, and if you like it, you can upgrade to the uh, Capture One Pro, uh, which I highly recommend. And uh, I work in sessions, and eventually I catalog later. That's a whole nother story, and you can watch our Capture One tutorial for that. But, uh, so I shoot RAW and then import my RAWs. Now, the next choice you have, RAW file type, you have compressed and uncompressed. I work with uncompressed. Uh, the compression is supposedly what they call lossy. You won't lose any detail. But, you know, I'm not one of those kind of guys who want to find out the hard way. Particularly maybe on long exposures and things where you have blacks and, you know, small details. So I just leave it in uncompressed mode. You can decide which way works best for you. I shoot with 256 gig cards and 128 gig cards. So I've always got a lot of storage, so it doesn't matter to me whether it's uh, uh, compressed or not. Uh, JPEG quality, when I'm shooting JPEG, I want the highest quality, so I either shoot fine or extra fine. So I'm, I have it set for fine, and I can always instantly change that if I want. 
JPEG image size, 42 megapixel, 18 or 11. I just keep it once again at the highest image size. Aspect ratio. Some of the Sony cameras have a lot of different aspect ratios. Uh, I particularly like shooting with some of the uh, cameras where I can do a square uh, setup one to one. But the uh, full frame here is three to two, which I always shoot at. Uh, if you're shooting and you want 1619, you can do that. And what that does is when you're at 1619, it puts a 1619 mask on the frame so that uh, you can see what that 1619 proportion looks like. So I'm gonna come back here and just switch it back to three two, and then you can see it fills out the frame a lot more when I do that. Uh, it's nice to have it out there. Sometimes I like to do landscapes at 16 to 19. Now the raw will come through as a full frame raw, but the JPEGs will come through at 16, 19. So essentially the only thing that 16, 19 and these two crop things are gonna show you is give you a reference for composition in the camera. APS-C Super 35, you can push that to side. I just set it for auto if I'm using a particular lens that needs to use it. Uh, this is more movie function. I don't use it that much, particularly with this camera. So that covers uh, menu screen one. We're gonna go into menu screen two. Long exposure noise reduction. Now this is uh, one you have to decide how you wanna use it. If you're out shooting stars and you're doing long exposures, and say I do a 30 second exposure, what long exposure noise reduction means is it's also going to do what is called uh, in, the, in terms black cow. And it's going to actually take another 30 seconds to make another file which masks out the noise. So you can do this noise reduction in your raw processing software. There's a lot of people that don't like to have this on because it slows down their shooting. It means for every 30 seconds you shoot, you're going to have a minute worth of exposing time. If you're shooting five minute exposures, you're gonna have another five minutes to wait for the camera to do a noise reduction. So you can figure out which way works best for you. I leave it on because sometimes I'm only doing three second exposures. Say I put a neutral density filter on and wanna shoot some water. And I like to get the long exposure noise reduction taken care of pretty quickly. So I leave it on. That's my setting. You have to decide which way you want to work, but if you're out shooting and the exposure gets too long, then go into your menu, long exposure noise reduction, turn it off. High ISO noise reduction. When you're using high ISOs, that's another place where you can introduce noise. Now this setting is only available if you're actually shooting JPEG, so you can see it's grayed out in my space, so I just leave it alone. Color space. You have two choices, sRGB, which as my friend Seth Resnick would say, stands for, and since we're a cable network, I can say it, shitty RGB. So I never use sRGB. The only time sRGB ever enters into my life is when I have to do something for the web. So I set it once again for Adobe RGB. Now this won't affect if you're shooting RAW, only if you're shooting JPEG. But if you do shoot JPEGs, might as well get the biggest color space out of them as you can. So I leave it at Adobe RGB. Lens comp, this automatically I leave at auto uh, for shading and uh, chromatic aberration. And you can also, if you feel you're shooting with a wider angle lens and want to set it to auto for say uh, wider ends, lenses to get rid of distortion, then go ahead and turn that on. I leave it turned off. And this is pretty much the default anyway as it comes here. Now, a lot of times when you're working with the Sony menus, Okay, you would think that once you leave a certain menu, it goes away, but you have to hit menu. If I hit OK now, it just kind of goes back and forth here. So if you want to return back to the original menu, you need to hit the menu button to go back. Kind of a idiosyncrasy. Once again, it's one of those funny things that Sony does. Screen 3, drive mode. Drive mode can be set in a number of different ways. It can be set using the function button. So uh, a lot of times if I'm doing drive mode, I'm switching back and forth between continuous, continuous high, medium low, or just single shot or uh, bracketing and or self timer. You have all these choices and this will actually pop up in the, the menu, but you can see here's the single, here's high. And by taking the multifunction key and moving to the left, the right, you can see I can go to low, medium and high. High is pretty darn fast. Look, if I shoot high, listen to how fast it goes. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now you notice the screen also blacks out. Uh, that's something you don't get with the uh, Sony uh, A9 when you shoot. Oh, I also should point out, if you're doing drive mode, you also have a two second self timer. Once again, by using the left right keys, you can go to 10 seconds, five seconds, two seconds. Okay, you also have your bracketing down here. 
So you can set your bracketing with the number of exposures as well as the exposure uh, difference between shots. Um, and you basically, once again, can use the left and arrow keys to uh, change it. If I'm doing brackets, I normally do bracket C, two stops with three exposures. So that gives me two under, one with two under, one with two over, and one right on. So essentially just leave it at that. So let me go back up here to single and set it for single. Go back to menu. Bracket settings. Self-timer during bracketing. Some people like to have the self-timer on just because uh, if they're going to be doing some long exposures or something. So you can either turn that off. I turn it off and that's how I keep my settings. So we go back in there. Bracket settings. Pixel shift mode. That's a whole other feature. Pixel shift mode has to be turned on here if you're going to be doing pixel shifting. I have an article about pixel shifting that I published a while back. You can uh, find the links in this article if you'd like to go take a look at it, but I leave it off unless I'm going to actually be using it. Memory recall. This actually sets all the settings that you set <clears throat> into memory, and you would sl slide it over to say memory one, push memory one, and it's now registered for slot one. And if I actually turn the top of the camera to one and then come back here, you'll see that memory recall is one now that I can actually recall. So it's recalled all the settings I used. So ISOs and all the focus settings, everything like that is preset. You can use that. I hardly ever use it, to be honest with you. I can shoot and do most of the settings very quickly. But if you're moving back and forth between, uh, say, movie mode and still mode or uh, different lighting conditions, specifically maybe if you're a wedding photographer, you might want to set up a, a different memory recall for uh, certain things. Church ceremonies might be one where you're doing a lot more candid work uh, with motor drive and so forth. You might want to be uh, set for memory recall too. Okay, that's one way you can do that. You can also do custom settings that same way. Select media, you're given two choices, slot one or slot two. Remember the A7R Mark III has two slots. I set it for slot one, very simple, easy to do. That covers us with the third screen of shoot mode. Fourth screen is register custom shoot set. So if you wanna say register, you can say register custom hold one, two, or three. So if you like everything you've set up, you can basically set that up. I just leave it alone. Um, if you're really getting into it, you can set it all the way up for setting into any one of the different numbers you want to use. Screen five, focus mode. I have it on continuous AF. If I select it, I can select AF single, which picks the spot, locks it in and while you have the focus hold button down. Uh, automatic autofocus, continue autofocus, uh, digital manual focus, which means that you can push the button uh, get it in focus and then make a manual focus adjustments afterwards. And then manual focus all by itself. So you can make those selections. Uh, as it is right now, I have it on AFC, autofocus continuous. So it's one of my default settings. If I'm out shooting landscapes, I'm on a tripod, I will use single. If I'm shooting people and people are moving, I'm moving, I'll do continuous, usually with tracking, and uh, we'll work that way. So let's go back. Priority set and autofocus. This is a confusing one, but essentially you have three choices. It means priority set and AF single exposure. If it's on AF, it will not let you shoot the picture unless it's in focus. Release, which is what I use, allows you to shoot for the moment, meaning your picture might not actually be in focus, but you're, you're, you're shooting anyway. Now the focus is pretty quick, so it hardly ever happens that you miss it, but that's uh, essentially meaning it'll take a picture even if it's not in focus. AF means it'll only take a picture when it's in focus. Balanced emphasis kind of balances both of those out and uses its own good judgment. You might have a fraction of a second where it doesn't take the picture and then says it's good enough and lets you take the picture. So I leave it on release, uh, which is, you know, let me shoot anytime I want. And I have priority set in AFC, balanced emphasis. Usually if I'm shooting in autofocus continuous, I'm going to be shooting quickly, maybe moving people. So I might have to take a chance sometimes and just hope that I get it right. So I just leave it in balanced emphasis. Focus area, you have a number of different settings. You can have wide, which uses a lot of the screen to uh, let the focus points go. It usually finds the subject and then kind of uh, zooms in on it. Uh, you have the zone, which kind of looks at different zones and focuses by the zone. 
You have the center autofocus, which basically puts everything in the center on autofocus. Flexible spot, manual, large, and medium. Uh, this is one that I tend to use a lot because this camera has a joystick in the back. This allows you to actually move the spots around. You can see that it's moving around uh, as, as I'm shooting here. So I can move with this joystick and put that spot wherever I want it. So this is one of my uh, more favorite uh, settings to use when I'm doing still shots uh, with uh, single exposure. If I want and I'm doing uh, continuous focus with a moving subject, I would shoot on down to lock on AF flexible spot and I default it to usually medium, but you have small and large. So you can kind of go in there if you want. You can see the, the spot's pretty small. And if I move it over to Michael sitting there, you can see that if I lock onto it and I'm moving the camera, you can see that it tries to stay where he is. So it's doing what you call auto focus tracking at that same spot. So whether I'm going up or down, and when you lose it or it goes a big square, you just kind of go back and it finds it again and tries to find it. So you got to kind of watch this one, but it's really handy to have specifically if you've got moving subjects and so forth. So once again, let me focus on uh, Michael, put my spot right there. The box is floating there. He's happy. He's just sitting there probably listening to something on his iPad rather than uh, listening to me. And we take the picture. Let's go back to menu and continue. Focus settings. Focus settings lets you determine how you want to do the wheels. I have uh, these two knobs, one goes up and down. Uh, so my uh, front wheel will do move the setting up and down. My rear wheel will move my spot uh, sideways. Uh, I kind of like to work with the center button and work with uh, the uh, joystick. This puts your spot uh, AF point and AF area in the same area when I go vertical or horizontal. So you can select this and decide whether you want the autofocus point and the autofocus area at the same spot, just the AF point or turn it off altogether. I have mine set for AF point and AF area. So if you're doing a lot of horizontal and verticals and switch them up and down and you find it's not registering at the right spot, this would be the place to come back and make your adjustments. AF illuminator, this thing is annoying. So uh, I have it on auto, it would only go off if it's dark. Uh, many people prefer it off. I'm going to set it off. Center lock on AF. I have it set to off. That just sets the center lock for autofocus to the center. Set face priority in AF. This is kind of a cool thing, especially if you're photographing family or certain people, or maybe you're shooting a particular model. You can register that focus, uh, that face, and then set the priority so it's always looking for that face when it's doing AF face priority. So you can set face priority in AF, I have it on. Face uh, detect frame display, I have that off. You can turn that on too, and that'll show you where the face is. AF track sensitivity, I set mine to be a little more on the faster side, responsiveness. Uh, when you get your camera, it's defaulted to standard. I've just gone ahead and moved it up to four. AF system, uh, it's invalid with this lens, so you'd have to have uh, a manual focus lens or a different lens on there to determine whether you're going to be using uh, contrast or phase detection. AF with shutter, I have it set for on, autofocus with shutter on. Uh, that actually means the shutter button itself. So the new Sony a7R Mark III has rear focus buttons, something we've asked for for a long time. A lot of people like to work with rear focus. Um, I like to work sometimes with the uh, shutter release where I can just press it down halfway. So depending on how I want to work, uh, I set it up. So right now I leave it so that uh, a half press button will get me in focus. Or if I want, I can do a rear focus button and I'll do the same thing. So right now I'm putting, pushing the rear focus button and right now I'm pushing the shutter release. So I have it set for both. I can operate it both that way depending on how you like to work at it. And I think it's positioned well. Um, so you can see my thumb is on that button easily to reach. I can feel all these buttons and know what they stand for. So that's how I work that. So I leave AF with the shutter on, but if you don't want that, you have to actually come in here and turn it off and that will not let you focus by pushing the shutter release button halfway down. Uh, a lot of people have different taste about that. We're into uh, the seventh screen of the number one uh, menu setting, camera one as I call it. 
And uh, we're doing pre-AF at this point. Uh, Pre-AF, I leave on. What that does is it actually starts the autofocus uh, prior to you actually pushing down the autofocus button. It means it goes a lot quicker and uh, we're obviously on our way to go. Uh, eye start autofocus, that actually starts the autofocus when you actually bring it up to your eye. Um, I leave that uh, off, I don't even touch it, but you have to have the right lens on to do it anyway. And uh, by the way, I've got the 16 to 35 millimeter lens on here, and um, it's set for autofocus, just so you might be curious. AF area registration, I leave off. Delete registration, uh, registered AF area, that's uh, so you can come back in there and delete it. I've just never even used that uh, to be very clear. Autofocus area auto clear, I have that off uh, so that it's always clearing that between shots. Display continuous autofocus area, I always leave that on. I like to know where all my areas are as I keep shooting. I'm in screen eight and uh, phase detector area. Watch what happens, I have it turned on. So when I turn it on and I'm actually looking at the screen, you see that uh, screen in the middle there with the rounded corners? That's the phase detector areas. If I come into the menu and turn it off and come back in, you can see that square disappears. So that, what that's basically doing is letting you know where the phase detect uh, areas are. This camera shoots with both phase detect and contrast uh, autofocus points. And so uh, by having that on and knowing where your phase detect uh, squares are and focus points are, it allows you also to make sure that you maximize your autofocus potential. AF micro adjustment, you would only use this if you've got uh, a non-Sony lens on here and you can fine tune the autofocus based upon adapters and different things like that that you might be using. I've never touched this to be honest with you. Screen number nine, exposure compensation. So exposure compensation allows you to uh, adjust the camera by several stops, a uh, total of uh, three stops either direction, under or over, uh, based upon exposure. So say you're working with aperture priority and you photograph a, a subject or a scene and you might find that the histogram is pushing to the left a little bit. That means you'd want to overexpose. So you just turn the dial on top to plus one, maybe one and a half, and away you go. So you can see in the screen at the bottom in the viewfinder there, it's at plus point, 1.7, it's in orange. And of course, if I go back to the menu, it says the same thing, exposure compensation. We will set that back to zero, just for the sake of moving on. Obviously, if you're into photography, you know that there are certain things that trip up uh, the meters. Um, the camera is always trying to take a scene and neutralize it, meaning trying to get it to like an 18% gray. That seems to be what the old uh, system was. So if you're shooting, say, on a snowy day and it's really bright out and you've got a lot of snow, uh, it's going to try to underexpose that image because it's going to try to turn the white of the snow gray. So you got to be able to trick the camera. And that's when you would take it and go maybe plus one and a half or one and uh, do exposure compensation. Take a picture and uh, use your histogram to determine how it is. And by the way, uh, I'm going to show you on the camera here itself, there's a button that says display. This is on the multifunction. If I move that, you can get to a screen where the histogram shows. So I always have a live histogram. And you can see as I move this around, the live histogram is changing. This is a really cool thing to have. And you can see right now, because I'm shooting at those bright windows in the back, I'm a little bit overexposed uh, and clipping. So I'm just going to move the button to the left a little bit. And I can actually move it to the point where I get detail on the outside and kind of balance it out with my live histogram. So this is one of the advantages over a DSLR is you've got all this live information coming at you and I have several different screens. So I've got a screen with all my settings, I've got a screen with all the settings on the outside and you can set the custom uh, function to show you what are those settings that you want. I tend to like a lot of information when I'm shooting. Um, then you have one with nothing except the autofocus point so you can move your autofocus point around and then of course you have one with the histogram. So let's go back to the total information screen. So that hopefully explains what that's all about. Reset uh, exposure uh, comp. And that just is a menu setting to reset EV comp. You either reset it or maintain it. Um, if you want to just reset it, just hit it reset and it turns everything to zero. Oh! 
<laughs> okay. Anybody who's been with us for videos uh, in the past, if you're hearing some odd noises right now, you would think we have a dentist office next to us, but uh, I'm in a building full of artists and I just happen to be next to a studio that does uh, sculpture. And this guy has always got his power tools out. He must know when we're doing videos because he's always making a lot of noise. So any background noise you hear, hopefully it won't be much, uh, is my neighbor, probably with his chainsaw, making another crazy wood sculpture. ISO, you can set ISO manually. I tend to like to work with auto, so I have it defaulted to auto. Push the right multifunction uh, selector. You can go to ISO minimum and then ISO maximum. I have it set for a maximum of 12,800, a low of ISO 100. This is really kind of the, the range I find that works. The 12,800 is a very usable ISO on the uh, Sony cameras, believe it or not. Um, some people go, oh, there's too much noise, but maybe those people never lived through pushing uh, Tri-X to 1200 back in the film days. I would have given anything for 12,800 ISO back then with the grain level that I get right now. So uh, if I need to, I have it set for 12,000 ISO or 12,800 ISO. And the next setting, when we go back to menu, would be setting the ISO minimum shutter speed. Now what's nice here is if you're using auto ISO, you can set the minimum shutter speed uh, so that it, you can avoid camera movement. I have it set for 1 25th of a second. ISO A, which is in orange, SS shutter speed at 1 25th of a second. I find that I can pretty much hold anything I want at that. If I'm shooting with a longer lens, I may decide to bump this all the way up to 500th of a second. Now, very typically for me, and one reason why I like this auto ISO setting is I like to shoot fast. So typically what I do is I set my camera on manual. I pick a shutter speed based upon the subject I'm going to shoot. So say I'm outside and I'm shooting uh, people walking or uh, say a horse running or a guy on a bicycle I might set the shutter speed to a thousand. And then I would regulate my f-stop based upon the amount of depth of field I like and I would let the ISO do the changing. So if I'm shooting a picture and I'm moving left to right from light to dark, the auto ISO will change but allow me to keep the same shutter speed and f-stop, allowing me to stop the action, get the kind of picture I want, and the only thing that's changing then is the ISO. So it's a great way, specifically if you're shooting a lot of wildlife, where you might be photographing a bird against the green and then all of a sudden the bird comes up against the sky. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, going back and having overexposed pictures, the ISO will go to a lower ISO to compensate once it comes across a, a brighter background. Brilliant stuff. Saved my ass a whole bunch of times. A firm believer in it, so uh, that's why that's set for minimum shutter speed of 125, auto ISO 100 to 12,800. Works great. Metering mode, once again, you can select a whole bunch of different metering modes. I set it for multi, so I cover pretty much the whole screen. But depending on the kind of scenes I'm shooting, I can move the center weighted, a spot, the complete entire average, and or highlight areas. So you can actually pick the highlight area and meter off of that. So once again, I'm going to come back up here to multi where my selection is done and go back into menu again. Face priority and multimetering, I have that turned on so that if I am shooting that way, that it's going to expose and look for the face and give me the best exposure for the face. Very good when you're trying to do backlit subjects. Spot metering point. I leave it set for center. That means if I'm using spot metering, the spot metering is going to be showing up at the center. However, if I set it for focus point link, that means that my spot focus point moves around my spot exposure point will link to that point and move with it. So if I'm focusing on a face that's off on the upper left corner, that also means that the spot metering point will be focused there too. So I know that if I need to use it, I can come back to it. Because I don't use spot focus metering that much, I leave it set to center, because that way I can kind of know where it is. If I'm getting into a difficult situation where the scene dictates, I can come in here to my menu and then set it to focus point link. Exposure steps. You have a half stop or third stops. I have mine set to a third stop, meaning each time I rotate my f-stop 
where my shutter speed is doing it by one third full F stop. Auto exposure lock with shutter, meaning if I push my shutter button down and uh, it's gonna lock the exposure, and that way if I move around, the exposure is gonna be locked. I leave it on auto. You have a choice of auto, on or off. Auto is the easiest way to do it, works perfect. Exposure standard adjust, this is something most likely, and it even tells you right on the screen, that you're not going to have to use, so just don't use it. Just cancel out of it, don't touch it. Um, you really kind of not gotta know what you're doing for that. Now, I don't use flash commonly with my system, so I'm not going to go into a lot of this, so I just leave it set for a default. But you have flash mode, which is fill flash, but you can do slow, rear shutter, uh, uh, front shutter, all sorts of crazy settings there. So that's something you want to explore on your own. Uh, since I don't use flash, I'm not going to try to be an expert with it. Uh, flash compensation. When I do use flash, a lot of times I'm finding that the flash doesn't expose the scene properly. So that's when I kind of go in here and set uh, the auto exposure compensation to go up a little bit with the flash. Wireless flash, if you're using wireless flash, you can set it on. Uh, wireless on, wireless off, wireless on, wireless off. I'm just gonna leave it off. And red eye reduction, if you got uh, a flash and you put it on top of your camera, uh, you can turn red eye reduction and it'll do its thing, which kind of like multi-pops the flash to uh, close the eyes down before you shoot the, the picture. I'm sure you've seen that work. I leave it off. Screen number 12 of 14 while we're getting there. White balance. Uh, white balance I leave on auto. I find that works the best. If I'm working in mixed light conditions, I'll normally pick one white balance and then try to make my adjustments later. In that case, I could either pick sunshine, shade, clouds, incandescent light, and you can see the gray in the uh, uh, viewfinder here changing. Fluorescence, fluorescent twos and zeros, so you get a lot of different fluorescent modes. Uh, white balance for flash, white balance for fish. Now it's really underwater, but <laughs> it's a cute fish there, isn't it? Uh, then you can actually set the degrees Kelvin and uh, custom settings. So I just leave it on auto white balance. It's pretty much where everybody would like to be, and uh, it, it works out well. Priority set and auto white balance. Auto white balance is standard, but you can set it depending on uh, whether you're on ambient um, or um, uh, setting it for the ambient color or the white color. So I just leave it on auto white balance standard. DRO, dynamic range optimizer. Just leave it on auto, that's probably the best thing. I know a lot of my friends don't even use it, they just turn it off. By leaving it on auto, it allows you to uh, make enough compensation that you're pulling better detail from your shadows and uh, making sure that your highlights uh, don't go too far away. Uh, you can have it on a couple different settings. I don't know, they should be visible if I do this. So let's just see. You can see how the screen's changing with each one of them. Um, so just leave it on auto and it kind of maximizes it perfectly for the contrast. So once again, uh, you can see poor Michael here has to be the model, but if I hold this out here like this and come in and push it, if I hold it and I push and I make my selections, you can see uh, LV1 kind of brightens up the scene, brightens up the scene more with LV2, even more with LV3, 4, it's kind of low contrast, gets even more foggier and low contrast, but it also gives me a lot more shadow detail. Notice under the desk, Notice uh, the areas where uh, Michael now is, his, his shirt's kind of uh, a lot flatter. So if I go back to auto, you can see the desk, underneath the desk fills in and uh, it looks more natural, probably more the way our eyes are seeing it. Um, you have also, you can do HDR, uh, but uh, we have to be set up to do that, which we're not. So basically just leave dynamic range on auto. Creative style. I don't know who uses this, but I'll give you a demonstration of what it looks like. So let me kind of go up here. Once again, our good friend Michael will be our uh, subject. A lot of times I put it to vivid because it, it gives me a kind of a vivid color. Watch the colors and the scene change. So here's vivid, here's neutral, here's clear, deep, light, portrait mode, Landscape mode, sunset mode, wow, look at that. Wow, that's what you really call a, a, a warm look. Night mode, autumn, like why in the world? We're spring and summer here, but they have autumn. We have black and white mode. 
we have a sepia mode. We got standard color once again, and we have vivid. I'm just going to leave it on vivid because it kind of gives it just enough punch. So you can see what that uh, effect does there a little bit. Uh, you can kind of pick the one you want just by trial and error. If, uh, picture effect. Picture effect only takes place if I have JPEGs turned on, and like there's words like toy, uh, camera, and all sorts of weird, goofy kind of stuff. Not anything I want to be mixed up with. If you want to play with it, set your camera to JPEG, and uh, go ahead and take a look at the crazy picture effects you can have. Um, kind of weird. Picture profile. Uh, this is pretty important if you're going to be doing video. Uh, if you're doing still photography, just leave it off. However, when we do video, our good friend Chris Sanderson recommends that uh, we are into picture profile one, two, or three, mainly picture profile two. You can go ahead and read all about those, or you can shoot video and try the different picture profiles out to find out what you like best. That's how I did it with Chris. I just set the camera up on tripod one day, stood in front of it, and said this is picture profile one, picture profile two. As you go into these, you can see once again the scene changes, so this is another advantage of mirrorless. You can actually kind of get a look at what the effects are, and you can see they're getting a lot lower in contrast. So now we're approaching into the different logs, and really weird looking there. And this is picture profile 10, which um, probably isn't very good for what you want, but if you're in uh, post-production, a lot of people like to work with these kind of picture profiles. Like I said, if I'm doing videos, I switch over to picture profile 2 one or three. Uh, picture profile two seems to be the one we like the best. So once again, that's up to you, but that's just usually for video only, okay? We're now into screen 13. Now you notice at the top of each of these screens when we uh, go into them, uh, you can see this is a focused assist screen. So this is gonna talk a lot about uh, doing uh, focus adjustments and so forth. Now focus magnifier, it's not on right now because I'm on continuous AF, but I'm going to kind of switch out of that real quick. So one second as we move from uh, autofocus single and we come back to the menu. And now if I turn focus magnifier on, it allows me to set a square that if I'm going to be doing manual focus, it shows me where that manual focus is going to be. So I'm going to set it into the center, okay? I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to turn on the manual focus. So now when I go in and I start, I turn the focus ring, you can see that it focuses in really high. And then if I push the shutter button, I'm now locked in on autofocus. Once again, turn the focus ring, magnifies out, and you can see how I can fine tune my focus. So if you're into manual focus, this will allow you to see good magnification. Once again, you can move the focus dot around, see the little orange dot moving around in the square there. You can see how that moves around, and I can do that with the joystick, so it's pretty cool. And as soon as I hit the shutter release button, I go back to full frame, and everything stays in focus. Kind of fun. Every now and then I actually play with manual focus. One of the things I gotta say, and of course this is me, I think the guy just fired up his warp engines behind us. <laughs> I tend to like autofocus. My eyes are old. I wear glasses. Um, I don't see like I used to. And I know there's a lot of people out there that believe in manual focus. And a lot of times people have uh, come by and said, hey, this camera's not working. And I go, well, it's not working. And I said, well, the pictures are out of focus. I said, well, that's kind of weird. It's a good lens, good camera, shouldn't be out of focus. And I said, well, show me how you normally shoot. And I watch them do manual focus. And I said, well, let me show you something. So I switch it over to autofocus, set it up for the kind of subject they're shooting, and then say, try using an autofocus. And all of a sudden, the pictures are in focus again. Okay, there's too many variables. Specifically with these high megapixel cameras, there's no room for error. So if I'm going to do anything, I would use DMF, which is the digital manual focus. Go ahead and let the autofocus kick in, get you to where you want to be, and then turn the focusing ring and fine tune it manually. At least that way you're a lot closer, okay? Don't forget there's uh, uh, some focus peaking and things we'll get into in a minute that will allow you to you know, maximize your potential for getting a better picture if you're doing manual focus. So just so you know, let's just leave it there and go back to the menu. 
focus magnifying time. Uh, you can say no limit, so I leave it on no limit. You can have it on five seconds or two seconds, but normally I leave it on no limit, and as soon as I push the shutter button halfway down, uh, it kicks back into full screen. So it depends on how you want to work, so I have it no limit. Initial focus magnification I have on one times one, but you can go to 6.2 if you want. So I'm just going to leave it on one. Autofocus and focus magnification, I have that on because I like to kind of get close if I want. I can push the autofocus button. Manual focus assist, I have set for on. Uh, that just helps you get better into you know, getting there in the first place. And then peak settings. Peak settings, I have peaking level on, peaking level um, at mid, and peaking color red. I tend to like peaking color yellow. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate focus peaking for you. So what this does is I do manual focus. Not only do I have the manual focus assist, which is the enlargement of the frame, like a magnifier, but I also have the focus peaking. So uh, if my subject's highlight areas and edge areas turn yellow, that means I'm in focus. So I know I've got it. So that's, uh, if you're doing manual focusing, that's the, the best way to handle that. Anti-flicker shooting. Uh, if you turn this on, that has a lot to do with uh, trying to regulate uh, oddball lighting. So if you've got lights that flicker, that uh, cycle through at different cycles and so forth. Noticing a flicker, you can turn anti-flicker on and it tries to compensate for shooting at the right speed to get rid of flickering. Kind of cool feature to have. Uh, once again, I'm going to leave that off because I don't normally need to worry about it. Face registration. So if you're going to uh, be shooting, say, uh, a portrait session, and or somebody who uh, may be in different groups that is a priority. So like, let's say Mr. Senator will do face registration. And what happens is you just go in here and click new registration, you aim the, the camera at somebody's face, okay? Shoot with fitting into the face frame, well, which is we're not really doing here. Be and uh, register face and I'll just say yes, enter and Michael is now registered in my camera. So no matter where I went, it's going to be uh, looking at him when I have face registration turned on and make sure that uh, he's got priority. So, and um, register's face priority is on. So if you want to turn it off, you can just turn it off and uh, register face goes away. And if you want to, you can also delete all. So I'm sorry, Michael, but I'm really probably not going to shoot you in any situation where I want to have face priority. So I guess delete all facial registered uh, faces. And you can register a number of different faces. Just remember who they are and uh, call them up as you need them. Uh, so that works with that. That takes care of the um, uh, menu settings, number one, the camera menu settings. And I call it camera menu because uh, if you go up here, that's camera. That's a camera. And that's camera one. And uh, sometimes we call it toolbox star, globe, and camera two settings. We will now go into uh, camera two settings. We are now into camera menu two, camera tab menu two. It's movie one, screen one. We're at exposure mode. Now I can't show you exposure mode because I can't capture uh, movie exposure menus uh, when I'm in this particular mode and if I go to the movie mode where you can see it, it thinks that I'm trying to do movie outputting and thus uh, negates the menu capture. So exposure mode will allow you to determine what exposure mode you want to use for your movies. We can come down here to S and Q, which is slow and quick uh, uh, capture. Uh, that determines the exposures you want to use for doing uh, slow motion and uh, quick capture um, movies. File format, this is where you can select the file format. I automatically always shoot everything I can in 4K, so I basically set 4K. Record settings, I use 30 at 60. Some people like to use 30 at 100 or 24 at 100 or 24 at 60. Uh, 30 at, at 60 is what we use. Once again, this is the slow and quick settings. Uh, record time, you can set the record time for 24, 30, or 60. And 60, by the way, if you notice here that the 60 is blanked out, well, that's going to be blanked out in 4K. So the only time you can go up to the higher uh, rate is if you turn 4K off. Frame rate, 
It's 120 frames a second, 60, 30, 15, 8. So essentially, this is quick frames, kind of like a time lapse when you're doing one frame per second. And the more frames per second is slow motion. So you can determine how you'd like to do that. So I just leave it set for 120 frames a second, presuming most of the time I'm going to want to do slow motion. And it's kind of fun once in a while if you're doing a quick video to set it up and do uh, slow motion capture. Proxy recording on, I just leave it off. Don't even know what it means, to be honest with you. So uh, I just leave it off. Movie two, AF drive speed, I leave as normal. You have a couple choices, fast, uh, normal, and slow. This means how fast it focuses um, as focus changes and when you're in autofocus mode. I kind of like the smoother, kind of more gradual, which is pr still pretty fast, so I leave it at the uh, normal. AF track sensitivity, obviously I want it to be responsive, uh, so that's where that's set. Auto slow shutter, I leave that on. Audio recording, I leave on. Most of the time, I'm always going to want to record an audio track. However, if you're doing something where you're using multiple microphones and you're recording off uh, line, uh, you can turn that off. Uh, most of the time, the way I've been taught and uh, Chris has taught me is we want to do audio recording because that also helps in uh, syncing up uh, your, your different cameras and different uh, images. So. Uh, it allows you to put the soundtrack very clearly and a lot of times before we do anything we just do a clap so that uh, the editor can find where the sync spot is for that particular noise and align everything up properly. So I leave audio recording on. Auto record level, uh, you can set that uh, right now because once again we're in movie mode you can't say, see that but you can actually have a numeric value where you can set that. Audio level display, I always leave on. That shows you both left and right channels as you're recording as uh, green horizontal, yellow and red bars at the bottom of the screen. Menu three, audio out timing. I just leave it on live. Wind noise reduction, turn that on. Marker display, I don't use that, so we leave it off. Marker settings, we don't use that, so we leave it off. Video light mode, you can do it on a power link. Once again, I just said power link, but uh, you can set it for auto if you want. Uh, movie with shutter, I leave off. Silent shooting. Now, this is now back into uh, some of the camera menus and modes. So right now, for example, if I take a picture, it makes a noise. If I want to use a silent shooting mode, I can turn it on, and now you don't hear anything. So this is really good if you're going into, say, doing a wedding where you can't make noise with the shutter or uh, you don't want to make any noise. You can just turn it to silent mode and turn it to electronic shutter and essentially just shoot all you want. For me, it's a little disconcerting. The uh, Sony A9, for example, has this, and I have to turn something on just to kind of give me a tactile, at least on the audio side, that I'm shooting pictures. So uh, to use it the way you want, but that's what that means. I'm going to turn it back off. E front curtain shutter, you can leave that on. I leave that on as standard, most people do. However, you can turn it off and be uh, syncing off the uh, back shutter. Release without lens, I have enabled. Um, that's fine, I don't mind uh, turning the shutter on and the camera on and shooting without a lens. So that means I can take the lens off, oh my God, and take pictures. But if you don't want that uh, to happen, then you turn it off. Now the next setting is a little more important. Release without card. Boy, oh boy, this one will bite you in the ass if you're not careful. So I do release without card disabled. That means I will not let the shutter do a release without a card in the camera. Um, nothing like taking the cards out to offload them and forget to put them back in the camera and go out and do a job, thinking you're shooting pictures only to find out that there's nothing in the card slot. So uh, essentially this means that if I don't have cards in my card slot, I can't shoot a picture. It's kind of a nice thing to have. The steady shot. One of the beauties is that there's in-body image stabilization. That's steady shot. I leave that on. I don't know why you'd want to turn it off. Steady shot settings. I just leave on auto. Uh, you can adjust it for vocal lengths if you have different lenses and longer lenses on. So uh, just and for the most case, if you do it manual, then you have this and you can pick the lenses that you have. And oh, look at all the lenses you can pick. So, you know, if I'm shooting with 800, I can set the uh, steady shot to be something tuned to an 800 millimeter lens, okay? But uh, I leave it on auto and the camera figures out what lens I'm using since I'm only using Sony lenses and it works out just fine. Zoom, uh, I do not do any optical zooming. 
uh, at all, so this is always turned off and not even uh, uh, being able to be displayed. Display button, uh, that determines what am I gonna see. So if I hit display, I'm gonna see monitor or finder. I want to see the monitor, so if I hit the display button, which is the top button, I'm gonna see the effects on the monitor. Finder monitor, uh, it's, not, it's disabled because of the way I'm shooting at this point, so you can't really see what it does. That should be obvious. Finder frame rate, this tells you whether the frame finder is uh, recycling the electronic viewfinder, which is very good in this camera, by the way. It's uh, the same quality as the A9, and it's a big step up from the A7R Mark II. Um, you can leave it on standard, and most people find it fine, but I leave it on high, and it gives like no kind of um, dragging effect. It really is um, a very nice effect. It feels like you're looking through a regular DSLR camera. Um, it's funny how many of my friends are DSLR users that say they'll never go mirrorless, and that's just mainly because they haven't looked at a mirrorless camera for a while. So if you end up uh, doing this and actually looking through and seeing how realistic it works and how much data you see and how good the electronic viewfinder is, uh, people are amazed. So I leave this on high to get a better frame rate. Zebra settings, once again, I can't show you zebra settings when we're capturing video from the HDMI outport of the camera, as we are here, but the zebra settings will uh, give you black diagonal lines over the highlight areas. And you can set the, the level, I have it set for 70, which is pretty high. Um, you can set it uh, all the way up to 100 only or above 100. So uh, you have custom settings too you can set them for. That's up to you. But um, this is kind of distracting in a lot of cases. So I don't really use it, but uh, filmmakers find it's a good thing to have because it allows them to see the highlight areas going uh, out when you're using it. So I leave it turned off, but if you're going to turn it on, um, I have it set so that the level will turn out to 70. Uh, sorry we can't show that, but hopefully most of you know what it is. Uh, grid lines is the uh, rule of thirds grid line. Once again, it's not going to show through um, on the uh, video output that we're using, but you can hit square grid, diagonal and square grid, or just turn it off altogether. I like rule of thirds. It also gives me a couple horizontal and vertical lines that uh, allows me sometimes if I'm shooting subjects with horizontal or vertical that I can use as quick reference to make sure that I'm lining up properly so it works out quite nice. Exposure set guide is set to off, either turn it on or off. Really, I don't know what that one does because I've never used it. So we're not even going to worry about it. Live view display, settings effect on. Now this is one of the, once again one of the beauties of uh, working with a mirrorless camera. So if you were working with a DSLR and went into an odd light bulb situation, light, you know, weird lighting, you're not going to see the effects of that lighting. Or if your exposure is way down, you're not going to see the effects of it. So I have setting effects on. This allows me to see what the effects of, uh, that, of the exposures and the lighting conditions I'm working under. Continuous shooting length. Uh, this will only show up if you're doing continuous shooting and it allows you to see how much continuous shooting you have left to do. Uh, if you're doing continuous shooting, it'll turn on into display and it'll show you how much longer you've got before you fill up your uh, memory and your buffer. Auto review, I have turned off. I don't really want to see my images afterwards. However, if you want to see after you shot a picture what the image looks like, you can turn it into two seconds, five seconds, or ten seconds. Uh, so that it stays on the rear screen. However, if you push the shutter button halfway down and you're ready to go back into another shooting sequence, it turns that off and goes back into the shooting mode. So I just leave it off. I don't really care uh, to see what my exposure is. If I do, all I have to do is hit the play button. So I might be shooting something and uh, if I take a break, then I hit the play button, just kind of go back to make sure I have it there rather than every time I take a picture, lower the camera to see what the picture looks like. You know, if I did my job right and the histogram was good, I've got the picture, don't need it. So let me go back to menu, let's turn it off. Custom key. You have a couple different custom keys and in these custom keys, you can decide what buttons do what, okay? so. In screen one, if I want to do the control wheel, I have it not set for anything right now. Uh, the defaults I find are pretty well set up here, but uh, you might find that you'd like to kind of set those differently. So that you can understand all the different custom buttons you have, uh, refer to your camera manual so you can see. But a lot of the buttons here are all customizable, meaning you can actually set different uh, buttons for different things. So, uh, some are labeled very clearly C1, C2, C3, 
but uh, there are a few others hiding there that you might want to set and change uh, the defaults of. Okay, and you can do this both in the uh, still settings, okay, which is here, the video settings, which are here, and the playback settings, which are here. So you can go ahead and set these whatever way you want. The one I set up already, so you're going to see the setup. I already went in and did the setup. But the function menu, which is the FN button on the back of your camera, is probably one of the, like a quick reference button. And essentially, if I hit the FN button right now, you can see that I have it set up for drive mode, focus mode, focus area, exposure compensation, ISO, metering range, I can go to silent shooting or uh, noisy shooting. I have silent shooting turned off. Prioritize the record media, which as you saw earlier, we are in card one. Creative style, white balance, format, sound off or sound on. And if I need to, I just turn sound back on. So this is what I use my function menus for. But let's talk a, bit, a little bit how they actually get set up versus the ones that are delivered to you as a default. So essentially, you just pick that menu item and pick the function position. Now, there's two screens. There's an upper, well, there's one screen, but there's two rows, row one and then row two. So this says function upper one. So function upper one is drive, and you can go down here, and let's just say we want to change the metering mode in function six on the top row, which is all the way over to the right. And so we'd come in here and decide, what do I want to change it to? And if I want to change it to a creative style or a picture effect, I can select that. Now, if I go to my function menu, you can see that picture effect is now selected as the number six position. Okay, and it's not available for the mode we're in, so it doesn't do me much good. But this is a button, if you really get the hang of it, it's very easy to customize and uh, works out really, really well for you. So back uh, to sum it all up, uh, this is now set so that I can easily make changes to the most important settings that aren't part of the dial settings and other settings on the camera. Uh, very nice to have the ability to customize all those. You can also do all your custom keys so that you can recall them, memory recall. A lot of cool ways you can work with things. The only problem is you got to remember if you're setting uh, different custom settings and uh, memory recalls what each one is for. Um, dial settings right now, you can see that the dial set so that I have the front dial set for my aperture and the back dial set for my shutter speed. Uh, you can turn that around if you want, so that one's on the left and the one's on the right. So uh, you can have, uh, you, it depends on how you like to work, but I like to have my f-stop on the front and my shutter speed on the back. So that means essentially this button here is controlling my f-stop and this button here is controlling my shutter speed and I can work with everything without ever taking my eye off the viewfinder. As we saw here, and we can decide whether we have a front or rear aperture or shutter speed, this one determines whether it's counterclockwise or clockwise. Normal is the way most people would like it, but if you want to have it the other way, you can actually reverse the direction so that uh, it goes a different direction. So that's up to you, but I leave it set for normal. Finally, we have uh, screen number nine of uh, camera tab menu two, uh, dial EV compensation. You can turn it off, but you can actually set it uh, for front dial or rear dial. Movie button. Now you can set this so that it's only available in movie mode. Okay, so if I'm in uh, still shooting and I'm doing aperture and I see something I want to do a movie of, I can just you know pick it right up right now and just hit movie, and it goes into record mode, and you can see that now I'm recording Michael. And uh, you'll be seeing on the back of the display, although you're not seeing it on the image I'm showing you. Uh, channel one and two for your audio, you'll see the record uh, light is lit to red. You'll see a histogram and you'll see the number of seconds of video that you've uh, caught. And then you hit the video button again to stop it. And uh, you're set to go. So um, some people don't want to have that movie button accidentally activated. So I leave it on as always. If I find that I might be hitting that button too often, like when I first got this camera, I was hitting that button instead of the rear focus button and it was driving me crazy. So at that point, I would just go and turn it off. And uh, now if I push that button, uh, it doesn't work. So I can't screw up. So there you go. 
and a couple more settings, lock operation parts. I have off, but if you want, you can lock things. This is handy if you're doing something and you're moving around a lot and you don't want to accidentally uh, change your f-stop or your shutter speed or anything like that. So you can come down here and just do a lock and lock those so the controls don't move. This would also be a good thing if you're going to use it to set up as part of your FN button. I know a lot of sports shooters and other people like to use it because if they lock in and at a thousandth of a second at F8 and that's what they want to shoot at all, all day, they don't want to be running around and accidentally finding out that the last 10 shots they shot were at a 30th of a second. So uh, this is the way you can both lock your dials and wheels or lock everything, period. So I leave it off unless I need it, but that's what it's there for. Audio signals are on, so that means I'm gonna get audio all over the place. Remember, I have it also set as a function menu, so I can turn it on or off. I told you I already like my noise, because um, I like that tactile feedback, but if I'm at a particular situation or I don't want it, you just go here and turn it off, okay? So that's why I have it set in there. So I have it turned on. So that wraps up our uh, custom operation two, camera tab two uh, menu set. Send the smartphone, okay. Now this is a cool thing that Sony does and it's quite ingenious. Um, and I've started using it more and more. Uh, this is where you can start sending things to the smartphone function. So if I send it to smartphone, uh, you can send uh, images to the smartphone. Uh, you have to have the smartphone Sony um, Play Memories app going. Uh, if I want to, I can send it to the computer if I'm hooked up uh, through um, uh, USB output. FTP transfer function, if I want to do that, that's good too. Control with the smartphone, this is fun because you can actually, once you're hooked up to the smartphone, you can control exposure, shutter, f-stop, ISOs, all sorts of things. Airplane mode is off. If it's turned on, it turns off all the network settings. So if I was working with Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi and so forth and I'm on the airplane, uh, they're pretty much going to want it to be turned off. Don't ask me why because I don't think it really affects things. It's <laughs> I've left it on many times. But uh, this is airplane mode, same as you have on your cell phone. Uh, menu 2, Wi-Fi settings. You can come in here and determine what Wi-Fi settings you want. If you're going to be doing Wi-Fi and shooting over Wi-Fi, Bluetooth settings, same thing. Location info link. If you're not really going to shoot to the smartphone, but you want to use your smartphone to send your geo tagging coordinates to the camera, then you can pair with your smartphone and just set location info set. And uh, once again, Bluetooth and everything has to be on to get it. But essentially, if you're in a good reception area and it's picking up GPS information, every time it takes a shutter, it'll pick up the GPS information from your phone and embed it into the metadata. So it's kind of a nice thing to have. Edit device name, you can change the device name here. Um, if I have a couple Sony uh, 7R Mark III's, I'm going to have um, the same uh, settings. So sometimes I could go in here and you can easily make corrections. Uh, I'm not going to do it here, but uh, you can change it to KWR1-7RM3, KWR2, 7RM Mark III, and that might be camera one, camera two, but it's identifying it as a 7R Mark III. So you can determine when you're looking at files what you're looking at. Import root certificate. I have no idea what this is, so I would presume if I needed to, I could do a root certificate. Uh, that's a new one. Reset network settings. If you need to reset everything so you can start over again, that takes everything that you've done off the table there. Playback menu. This is the uh, fourth tab. So a couple quick things before I go on. I like to use the smartphone um, adapter quite a bit, and essentially the way you do that, and once again, because we're hooked up here, we can't really show it, but if you want to sync to your smartphone, uh, you set the whole settings and it will put a QR code on the back of your camera, you use the camera of your iPhone, it pairs it automatically, you go and find the camera in the Wi-Fi settings, so you have to select the camera at Wi-Fi settings, and essentially that pairs it up. So now everything you're seeing on your iPad or your iPhone is what the camera is seeing. So uh, you can trigger the camera, you can look at images, the images are transferred over to the iPad or iPhone. So it works off pretty good. So um, it's kind of fun to have. I think people are gonna use that function more and more. It's still a little tricky. 
uh, to set up. I'd wish it would be so easy that someday you just push a button and it automatically pairs and you don't have to go doing half a dozen settings to get there. So it's not as easy as it could be, but it's pretty cool if you want to take the effort to, to use it. And some people will find it to be very useful. Uh, we're in the playback menu mode now. Protect means we, I can protect my images uh, all with this date so that they can't be erased and so forth. That's nice to have if you want. If I have to rotate the image, I can come in here and rotate the image, determine which way I want to rotate it if in playback mode. Delete images. I never delete an image from a card. I know a lot of people do, but you know, cards are so cheap and they're so big now. I'd much rather delete after the fact. You can do ratings, so if you know you got that shot, say you're standing outside and you know you got this beautiful sunset, you've got a rowboat on the lake in front of you paddling through and it's definitely a five star, you can set it here and then uh, the set ratings, you can basically uh, set your ratings to five star and uh, be done with it. Uh, rating set custom key, this is one you can actually assign a custom key so that it turns on the rating and then you can set ratings. Specify printing, so if you're doing printing, uh, I never print from the camera, but uh, if you wanted to do that, you could. Playback menu two, you've got copy, enlarge image, enlarge initial magnification of image, initial position, slideshow, so you can do all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, you can select pay playback media because I'm shooting a card one, I'm, I'm uh, playing back from card one, but if you're recording your videos to card two, and your stills to card one, or your JPEGs to card two, and your RAWs to card one, you can determine which slot you play back. You can determine the view mode, uh, and you can go into the date mode, which is how I usually leave it. You can look at everything in a folder, and you can look at the different video settings. Now, I'm gonna try something here in the playback mode. So I'm gonna go to play, and I'm going to scroll back. So you can see as I'm scrolling back how I'm playing my images. Now, while I'm in a playback mode, I can use the black display button, and let's find a good picture of Michael there. That one might work. And now I can use my display button, and I can look at what the displays were, the histogram and the blinkies, and so forth. So you can see I've got underexposed areas, overexposed areas. He's looking fine. You've got the histogram showing, and you have all the data you shot the camera with ISO 8000 at a 1 25th of a second, F5 and then I can go back to no, nothing. So you can kind of regulate the uh, information by hitting the display button in the playback mode. We are now in Toolbox tab, screen one of seven. And uh, once again, we're gonna be in monitor brightness. Now, because we're once again recording this through an HDMI port, I can't show you uh, what these settings do, but I can tell you about kind of obvious. Uh, the monitor settings sets the uh, brightness of the um, rear screen. The viewfinder brightness is set uh, by the next selection. And what happens is if you decide to set it, you select it and it says look through the viewfinder and you can say auto or you can say manual. And if you hit manual, you go into uh, uh, a, a horizontal bar and you can set plus two, minus two, and you can set the way you want. On a monitor brightness, I always have it set for sunny day. This is a much better rear display than on the previous camera system, so it's very visible when you're out in the daylight. It works out pretty nice. So uh, that's what we have. Gamma display assist, I leave that off. It's on uh, auto, S-log too. So this is all based upon different filming. Um, so I'll just leave this off unless you're into the movie making side of things, and uh, then it'll come in handy for you. Volume settings. I like to have volume, um, some people don't. So I have it set and you basically set it like this for around there and uh, it lets me know the volume of the camera, it beeps at you and so forth. Um, many people hate that and sometimes I do too. Nothing like standing out there with 20 people and everybody's autofocus uh, uh, beepers beeping. So it depends on how you feel. I, like I said earlier, I like that audio tactical, uh, tactile feedback so I do it. Uh, if you're going to delete an image, you have a choice of just deleting without asking or deleting with the option to cancel first. I would never want to delete something without being asked, um, so I have it cancel first.
Screen two, display quality, just I have it set for high, you can have it set for standard. Power save start time, I have my camera set to start or shut down after two minutes. You can have one minute, 10 seconds, all the way up to 30 minutes depending on how you shoot. Auto power off temperature. If the camera reaches high temperature, if you're doing a lot of video, for example, and or you're out on a hot day and it reaches a certain temperature, uh, it automatically will shut down. You want it to power off standard or do you want to risk it and have it set off at a higher temperature? So you can determine which uh, way you'd like to go with that. NST PF power selector, European versus uh, American uh, video. Cleaning mode uh, kind of gives you a shake. Uh, what it does is use the IBS uh, motors and rattles the uh, sensor for a while and hopefully shakes off any dust. Uh, a lot of times I do this a couple times during a day if I'm doing any kind of heavy shooting. And when I do do it, I normally have the lens off and I point the camera down so that if there is any dust there, it falls out of the camera and just doesn't hang around at the bottom of the camera to become stuck to the sensor later on. Touch operation. Do I want to have the rear screen operate on touch? Now, one of the things that's nice about the A7R Mark III is that you can also uh, touch where you want the focus point to be. So I have it set for touch operation on, touch panel pad. You have panel and pad, pad only, or pad, panel only, or pad, and I have it panel only. Touch pad settings. You can say operate in a vertical orientation. I have off because it's too small when I do that. Touch position mode is absolute position, so wherever I point it, it will go. And the operation area is the whole screen, but a lot of times you only might like the right or the right quarter, depending on whether you want to stick your nose somewhere and things like that. So I use the whole screen when I use it, so you can determine how you want to use it, but you have all these areas where it actually takes place if that's how you want to work. TCUB settings. Uh, this is the, uh, for, for video once again, it allows you to set the uh, times and uh, output times and so forth. I really never use this, so I really would not be an expert at giving you any guidance for this particular one. Remote control. Now, there's some cool things you can do with a remote control. A lot of times, if I'm doing my own videos, I want to have a remote control, and there's some infrared remote controls. If you have one of those and you can't get it to work, go in here and turn it on. Uh, it doesn't probably hurt to keep it on unless you, know, you want somebody else setting it, but um, leave remote control on, and that way you can control your camera with the remote. Um, HDMI settings, HDMI resolution is auto. Uh, these are all kind of standard. 24p at uh, 60p output. HDMI info display is on. I want to know all these different things, so I leave them on. Uh, record control, I leave off. Once again, this is, you know, if you're into video, I hardly ever do any video with the A7R Mark III, except for maybe a quick clip if there's something I see when I'm out there. Once again, back into this thing, certain things aren't going to show because of the way we're outputting, but you have 4K output settings. Uh, you have the USB connection. So if you want, you can also use a USB connection to do mass storage, uh, and you can control that uh, different ways. So once again, that's grayed out. Uh, the USB LUN setting, I leave it as multi. You can leave it as single. Um, this is for if you're having some issues with your USB connection, you can try turning it to single. USB power supply. Some people use an additional power supply to power their camera, which means if you're tethered to a computer, you can use the computer's power through the tethered cord to power your camera. So if you want, you leave USB power supply on. Uh, that's easy enough to do. PC remote settings, if you want to control your uh, computer through the PC or personal computer, say PC only or PC and camera. Um, doesn't really matter since I don't really ever control the camera that way, but uh, I might want to be able to do it with PC and camera if I'm in the studio or if I'm shooting something and the camera is way high up in the air or I'm somewhere where I don't want anybody messing around with my camera, I can just say PC only. So I just kind of leave it at that. Language, you haven't figured it out by now, it's English, right? Date timestamp, um, yes, I want the date timestamp to go in there, but this is where you, when you first get your camera, you'll be given this menu to say, what language do you want the menus in? What time is it? What date is it? So you have to do some initial settings. Um, so you would come in here and I want it displayed, in my case with the month, the day, and the year, uh, but you can change it to a number of different combinations like that, depending on what country you're from. 
Screen number six, record media settings. This tells you how you want to set up your recordings. So I want to prioritize my recording media to slot one. I can also record it to slot two. Recording mode is standard, but you can do simultaneous pictures, simultaneous video, simultaneous video and pictures. I can sort my RAWs and JPEGs so I can send them over to different uh, cards and so forth. So it depends on how you want to set it up, but that's what that's for. Auto switch media, this is turned on so that when I fill card one, card two automatically is selected. And uh, you have a little picture that shows up down there that shows that on slot one, I'm doing both stills and videos. So if I went in here and um, changed this to just this, you'll see now that the stills are also going to slot two at the same time, okay? So I'm recording simultaneously to both cards, still pictures, simultaneous both cards film. If I hit this, you can see now that everything I put on card one will also be put on card two. So it depends on the sensitivity of what you're shooting and you know how sensitive you are to those things. I'm just gonna go to standard and leave it there. And essentially what I'm doing is filling up card one with my videos and stills and then automatically switching to card two when I'm done. Select record folder. You can select a different folder or name a different folder if you want. Uh, by default, it names its own folders and sets it. If you need to do a new folder, you got to go in here and you got to identify what the new folder is and it's already created. So then you can come back up here and display record folder. So just so you know how that works. Folder name using the standard form. Uh, you can also use it with a date form. Recover image database. Sometimes this kicks in automatically. Don't be concerned if it does. It just means that the camera is actually reading the card and re-indexing things so that everything is in order and you're not gonna lose any images. Display media info. Uh, if I hit slot one, this will tell me that I'm shooting raw images in slot one and I have the ability to put 2,392 more images there or seven hours and 12 minutes of 4K video. So that's how that's set. So it just is telling you what's left in your media card. And last but not least, we have screen seven of our toolbox, which is our version of the camera, which is, you can see, version 1.0. The lens is 0 0.02, and uh, where everything should be cool there. And down here, I can do a reset on everything that I've already got in there. So you just have screwed up so badly or something's not working and you need to start from scratch, this is the place you go. Last but not least is my menu one. And there's two screens, and this is where you basically can add on what you want for your own menu. You can see there's two screens here. If you want to add an item, you hit add item and pick what item you want and put it in there. I have file format, raw file type, formatting, long exposure noise reduction on. Remember I told you this is when I turn on or off quite a bit. Uh, sometimes I don't want to see the phase detect and I do a lot of cleaning. So if I need to reach something without going through all those menu tabs, I have them all set here and it's very easy to set by using this area here. Um, and you can delete a page and you can have multiple pages. I only have one. Very simple to work with. So that pretty much covers uh, how to set up menus. I'd like to say thank you to Michael who sat here and uh, done the recording for all this. Appreciate it very much. This is the first time I've ever done a menu settings like this. If you like it, let me know. It's kind of long, but if you sat down with your new camera and followed these settings, you could get up and running fairly quickly. And uh, once you get the hang of it uh, and you get the, uh, the chance to explore these menu buttons, you'll find out that the uh, Sony cameras, and for that part, almost any camera today that's available, have these powerful features. And all you gotta do is sit down, take a little time and learn how to use them. However, you know, the manual is not going to help you a lot. So you kind of have to experiment and, and do it as you go. I highly recommend that you get uh, the manuals and download them to your devices. I'm sure most of you have iPads and uh, phones. Um, this way I have them downloaded both my phone and my iPad. And if for any reason I'm out in the field and I have a question about what this stands for or what that stands for, I can always go into my iPad and take a look at it and figure out what to do. So I uh, highly recommend you do that. I download them as a PDF and then I import them into the books function on my iPad here. And if I go to my books function and 
show that to you. I have a spot which basically is manual. So I have all my camera manuals, software manuals, different things like that all here. And if I needed to like learn how to use my Hero 5 and have a question about it, I've got it right there and I can go into uh, the manual and find it. So I don't have to carry a lot of paper around in my camera bag. I've got a reference anytime I need it. And sometimes you have nothing to do on the airplane and you just want to read a manual. Does that happen to you? Happens to me. You just get your iPad out and go to the manual section of the books and away you go. I hope all of you have a chance to take a look at a lot of the other videos we've been putting up recently. We've got some great series with Charlie Kramer. We've got the Good Leica story and we've got a lot of videos we've done with some of the products. We're going to be doing a lot more videos as time goes on. So I appreciate you being part of the Luminous Landscape family and I'll see you on the Luminous Landscape.